We started a brand new series last Sunday called Break Every Chain. And uh, it's, I was amazed at the response, the feedback that we got this week. Um, absolutely incredible. And last Sunday, I told you the first step to recovery is this. Realize I'm not God. I admit I'm powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing, and my life is unmanageable. Now, if you're in the room and you didn't get sermon notes, and you say, well, I don't really need them <clears throat> because uh, I don't struggle with any kind of addictions or any kind of habits, hurts or hang-ups, um, you probably have friends and family that you love that do, people that are close to you. So if you didn't get notes, raise your hand, and somebody will bring them to you so that you can fill these out. And somewhere down the road, you'll be able to use this to help make a difference in somebody's life, okay? But a lot of times, um, we'll ask the question, how do you break out of hurts, habits, and hang-ups? How do you break out of those things? <clears throat> Here's the first thing. You've got to get past denial. We've talked a little bit about this already. But denial is what keeps us from breaking chains of addiction in our lives. We excuse ourselves by saying, really, it's no problem. I got this. I got this. I'm fine. I can handle it. We excuse ourselves, but we accuse other people. We play the blame game. Um, we say things like this, if my wife or if my husband would just quit doing this or quit doing that, I could fix this problem, but she just compounds it and makes it worse. That's the blame game, and it's, it's a result of denial. So we have to learn to deal with denial. Now, denial is not a river in Egypt, okay? It's a real thing, right? I recently read about a lost and found ad in the paper, and this is what it said. Lost, a three-legged dog. Blind in right eye, left ear missing, broken tail, recently castrated, answers to the name Lucky. That's what I call denial. What about you? Uh, what's the antidote to denial? What makes me finally face up to my problems? God's antidote to denial is pain. Last week I said we rarely change when we see the light. We change when we feel the heat. We don't change until our fear of change is exceeded by the pain in our lives. <clears throat> Most people never really move into recovery until they're forced to move into it because there's no other option. There's no other door to walk through. <clears throat> God uses three denial busters, and these are not in your notes, but I'd write them down if I were you. I should have put them in there. But he uses three denial busters, things to get your attention, to force you to move into recovery from things that have just absolutely messed up your life. The first one is crisis, and that can come in many different forms. It can come through an illness, a stress, uh, a loss of a job. Just the list goes on and on. The second one is confrontation. Somebody loves you enough to confront you in truth and love, and they need to say, and they sometimes will say, you're missing out. Look, you're about to lose your family, or you're about to lose your health. You're about to lose your job. You need to get some help. You need to get some help. An old saying in Texas goes like this. If somebody calls you a horse's ass, ignore it. If two people call you a horse's ass, look in the mirror. If three people call you a horse's ass, buy a saddle. <laughs> if three people call you a workaholic, buy a saddle. If three people call you an alcoholic, buy a saddle. If three people say you need to get some help, buy a saddle. And by that, I mean get some help. Amen. Pain is like a check engine light. Engine light goes off. Warning you that something is wrong with your car. When you feel pain, listen folks, it's letting you know that something is wrong in your life. When the check engine light comes on, the right way to fix that is to plug in an OBT, OBD2 sensor or scanner and check for codes in your car's system, right? The wrong way to deal with a check engine light is to put a piece of black electrician's tape over the light. So you don't have to see it or think about it anymore. Uh, that's denial, and you're going to have problems. When pain happens in our lives, a lot of people just cover it up with food, alcohol, sex, many, many, many different kinds of things, but it doesn't deal with the problem. Again, that's denial, and eventually you're going to break down big time. You're going to crash and burn. So let's get some help. Look at somebody and say, let's get some help. The third thing I'd tell you about the way God allows things to have in our life is catastrophe and so help me I, I hope God doesn't have to allow that to step back and allow that to happen in your life when the bottom falls out physically emotionally spiritually financially relationally uh, when that happens you hit rock bottom sometimes God will step back and, and let us feel the full impact of our own stupid decisions sadly a lot of people will blame God 
for circumstances and outcomes that they have behaved themselves into. Amen. The second step is, is what's known as the hope step. Step one says, I admit it, I'm helpless, I'm powerless. Step two says, earnestly believe that God exists, that I matter to Him and He has the power to help me recover and break those chains. The second step is based on Hebrews 11 and 6. Anyone who comes to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. There are three parts to breaking chains in this second step. The first thing you need to know is acknowledge God's existence. And you may think that's just so simple, but let me tell you why. Let me unpack that and tell you why it's so vitally important. Now, most of you have no problem with this. I get that. There aren't that many atheists left in the world anymore. Now, I know the few that are out there, they're very loud. So you know they're there, okay? But atheists make up a very small percentage of the general population. In 2016, a Gallup poll revealed that 9 out of 10 people in America still say they believe in God, and less than 3% in America say that they are atheists and have no belief in God. Listen, it takes more faith to believe there is no creator than it does to believe it all just randomly happened or evolved. I submit to you, where there is a creation, there is a creator. Where there is an effect, there is always a cause. Where there is a design, there is always a designer. Amen? Romans 1.20 says, Since the creation of the world, God's invi invisible qualities, His eternal power and His nature, His divine nature have been clearly seen. And then Psalm 14 and 1, the fool says there is no God. It's irrational and illogical not to believe in God. If you have a problem with that, then you probably haven't been to one of our Easter services here at Cross Point. Every year, I love to, I, I prove, I mean, I just... There's no way to dispute what we, what we talk about on Easter. And sometimes I'll throw it in there during Christmas. But I prove the, the veracity and the reliability of the written documentation, the historical documents of first century history that we have contained in what we call the Bible today. And I'll do it again this year. In fact, this is a new announcement. We'll be having five services on Easter weekend this year, two services on Saturday evening and three services on Sunday morning. Amen. And we don't do that because we just think it's fun. We do that to make room for everyone. Everyone. We don't want to turn anybody away. You see, here's the deal. I'm, I'm guaranteeing, I, you know, I can't guarantee it, but I, I, if I was a betting man, and sometimes I ain't, no, I'm not. Uh, but if I was a betting man, <clears throat> that's why I'm preaching this series. I'm just kidding. Loosen up. But I'd bet you we fill every one of those seats on, on Easter Sunday this year. So from 3 to 4 to 5, oh, what a time to be alive. That ain't no job. That's me fighting old age, and it ain't working for me, is it? That's what I thought. But I get to prove the historical veracity of Scripture five times this year. Now, the point is God changes lives today. God exists. The real issue for most is not, is there a God? That's a given for the majority. The real issue is what kind of God is he? What is he really like? Does it matter? The problem is we have some very strange ideas floating around in our culture about the kind of God that he is. Last year I preached a series called The Wrong God. It was one of my favorite all-time series that I've ever done. I talked about the fact that some people don't believe in God because the church has presented the wrong version of God to the world for years and years. And I stood here and told you the version of God that the majority of the church has presented to the world, I don't believe in that God either. And we tried to paint a clear picture of God to our people, and, and a lot of people connected, and it had an impact in their life. But I, I'm going to tell you, in fact, I, I went as far as to say that it's hard to convince the world of the wrong version of God. We need to get this right. Here's the thing. Most of you get your ideas about God by thinking he's like a parent, your, your father or your mother. And that's tragic. Because if your father was indifferent, cold, and unloving, then you tend to think of God the Father that way. If your father was somebody to be feared, then you tend to think you need to be afraid of God. If your father was abusive, then you tend to think that God is abusive. If your parent was uncaring, then you transfer all of that over to God. Instead of making God, uh, instead of God making you in His image, you make God in your image, and that's the wrong version of God. 
Every once in a while, I'll hear somebody say, I've always thought of God as, and then they kind of define their, you know, their view of God. And I'm thinking, big deal. It doesn't matter what I think God is like. It doesn't matter what you conceive him to be. What I want to know is what is he really like? What is he really like? So the second thing I'll tell you today, you can feel this in. Understand God's character. Understand God's character. The second part of the second step in breaking chains of addiction is not just to acknowledge his existence, but to understand God's character. What is God really like? For most people, until they know what God is really like, they don't trust him. They don't trust God. The good news is God wants you to know exactly what he's like. He's not trying to hide from you. So he came down to earth 2,019 years ago and came in the form of a human being He came as Jesus Christ, and he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. This is what God is like. Notice this verse. Christ is the visible expression of the invisible God. If you want to know what God is like, just study the life of Jesus. Jesus, because he's the visible expression of the invisible God. Now, if you're reading about Jesus and studying his life, you're going to learn a whole lot about God. Strategically and specifically, three things we learn about God from studying the life of Jesus that helps me get over my habits, my hurts, and my hang-ups. So let's break that down this morning. Number one is God knows everything there is to know about my circumstances. He knows the good, the bad, and the ugly. And some of you have had a tough week. Some of you have had a tough month. Some of you have had a really tough life. King David said, you know how troubled I am. You've kept a record of all my tears. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that incredible? The Bible says that God knows you up close and personal. He's kept a record of every tear that's ever fallen out of your eyes. Nobody knows how I'm struggling to break a habit, preacher. You're wrong. God knows. Nobody knows the depression and the fear that I'm going through, you're wrong. God does. And he's kept a record of all your tears. He knows it all. Nothing escapes his notice. The scripture says, you know how foolish I've been. God, you know how how stupid I've been. Sometimes we, we want to forget this part. We don't want God to know all the dumb stuff we do. The fact is, there's nothing off the record with God. You have an audience 24-7. Can I get a witness? Woo, amen. 24-7, he knows the good days, the bad days, the dumb stunts, the foolish decisions, and amazingly, he still loves you even when she don't. He still loves you even when he don't, right? He still does. Secondly, God cares about my situation. He is like a father to us, tender and sympathetic, for he knows what we are made of, dust. Everybody say dust. God knows what we're made of. We're frail, we're not superhuman, but he's tender and he's sympathetic. That's the kind of God that you and I serve, one who knows you. God wants to be the father that many people have never had, tender and sympathetic. Jeremiah said, God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Everlasting love, amen? Amen. He loves me on good days. He loves me on bad days. When I serve him and when I don't, when I'm right, when I'm wrong, How does he keep on loving me like that? It's based on his character. His love is unconditional. It's not based on your performance. Aren't you glad it's not based on your performance? Man, he he not only knows about your situation, the Bible said he cares about your situation. The Bible says God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us. Now, Alcoholics Anonymous has a, a second step commonly referred to as the higher power step. And they'll break that down sometimes in meetings and they'll say simply that means there's a power greater than ourselves. This is bigger than us. His name is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is that power that you can plug into. Amen? Because he knows about your situation. He cares. The best news of all, he has the power to change it. He has the power to change it. Third thing I'll tell you, God can change me and my situation. Yes, he can. That's good news. God can change me, and he can change my situation. Sometimes he changes me, sometimes he changes the situation. Sometimes he, he changes both. But he's waiting on you to take a step. We've been, this is the second step we've talked about, okay? We're going to give you an opportunity at the end of this time together today to take another step. 
Because God's got the power to connect you. Notice Paul says, I pray that you'll begin to understand how incredibly great his power is to help those who believe him. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, if God can raise Jesus from the dead, he can raise up a dead relationship. He can raise a person back to health. He can set you free from an addiction, a habit, a hurt, or a hang-up. He can help you close the door on the past so those memories stop haunting you. If you'll just take a step of faith and lean in to where God is waiting for you. The Scripture says, what is impossible for men is possible with women. No, it don't say that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it says, I see it if you're paying attention. What is impossible for men is possible with God. Amen? Amen. But you don't understand my situation, PT. I've tried to change, but I can't. I've tried endlessly to change. Nothing is impossible with God. And that situation that seems hopeless, it isn't. It isn't. This week, we had invited one of our cross pointers to come in, and months and months ago, uh, when we were asking you to share your story, she s- sent her story in, and I hated to cut it down, and, but I asked her to cut it down and, so I could use it in a sermon. And she came in, and we videoed the, the story, and it's just powerful. It's powerful because it focuses on the power of God to break chains. Take four minutes and watch this video. Nearly nine years ago, I responded to an altar call where I experienced an instant miracle, and my life was forever changed. Before that day, I was emotionally, mentally, and spiritually broken and tightly bound by the chains of alcohol addiction. For me, alcohol was an escape, a release, and a prison all in one. I had battled depression, fear, and anxiety for years, and alcohol was my quick fix for all of it. Even though I knew I had a problem, I became lost in my addiction. I was a highly functioning alcoholic, but I was in denial about how bad it really was. I was running away from my problems and my hurts and to alcohol instead, trying to drink away the painful memories and forget the many mistakes I had made. Like many addicts, I felt guilt and shame about my problem, and I constantly promised myself and my husband, Nick, that I would quit, but when I tried to stop, I experienced withdrawals too intense to deal with on my own. I could no longer go more than 24 hours one day without alcohol before the tremors, Racing heart, anxiety, sweating, headaches, and everything else that comes with detoxing would set in. I felt trapped, scared, helpless, and hopeless, and I couldn't imagine a life of sobriety, even though I longed for it. Nick tried to help me, but addiction is very ugly, and it brought out the worst in me. It caused my marriage to suffer, but Nick never gave up on me, and I thank God for him every day. My alcohol addiction nearly cost me my marriage and my life. Before my miracle took place, I sank deeper in emotional pain and anguish. Thoughts of suicide tormented me and I wanted an escape. I was tired of fighting the addiction and failing every single day. My husband deserved a better wife and my children deserved a better mother. I hit my rock bottom in May of 2010 when one of my childhood best friends completed suicide. Her name was Laura. Losing her like that was unbearable. Deep down, I knew that I was slowly heading down that same slope and I knew that I needed help. I didn't know how to ask God for help and I certainly didn't think I deserved it even if he could help me. The day after my friend's memorial service, and with a heavy heart, I went to church with my mom. And at the end of that service, I headed to the altar where several people prayed for me. And through God's amazing power, my chains of alcohol addiction were broken right then and there. I never had the urge to drink again after that moment, nor did I ever experience a single withdrawal symptom. No shaking, no heart issues, no anxiety and incredibly, absolutely no temptation or desire to drink alcohol or to get drunk ever again. Every day after that was like a miracle, not only because I could function normally without the alcohol, but also because I had hope. Hope in a powerful and loving God that saw me at my darkest and chose to help me anyway. 
Hope that I was made for more than my past mistakes. Hope that I could be the wife and mother God intended me to be. Purpose to live a life where I could one day bring hope to others who are struggling like I had. This year on May 23rd, I will celebrate nine years of sobriety. That's 3,285 days. And at one point in my life, I couldn't even go one day without alcohol. I'm so thankful that he didn't give up on me even when I wanted to give up. I now cling to the hope I have in Christ, and I want everyone to experience God's power in their lives. It's my hope that anyone who hears my story understands that God still breaks chains today and performs miracles. I am proof. And in the words of Zach Williams, if you've got chains, he's a chain breaker. Amen. Yes, he is. Come on, let's give God some good praise. Amen. Takes a lot of courage to share a story like that. Amen. And I just saw Kelly's in this service, and uh, what a powerful testimony. The longer you postpone your pain, the harder it is to break every chain. You just keep putting it off and putting it off. The longer you deny it and say, you know, it's really not a problem. It's not a big issue. I can deal with it. I can handle this. The fewer days you have on this earth being all God meant for you to be and being able to discover your purpose in life. Third thing I'll tell you today is in your notes, accept God's offer to help me. Accept God's offer to help me. It's not enough just to believe in God. Most of you in the room believe in God or you wouldn't be here. That hasn't wiped away the hurt. You've got to plug into the power and that's more than just believing. Here's what God has to offer. Philippians 2.13 says this. For God is at work within you, giving the will and the power to achieve his purpose. God says willpower on your own is not enough. Kelly just said she tried to do it on her own and she just couldn't do it. And until she plugged into the power source, she was not able to sustain the kind of recovery and breaking those chains. God says good intentions are not enough. What you need is my will and my power to help you change. And God says, I'll give you the willpower. You say, God, I'm scared of change, so I don't even know if I want to try this or not. I'm, I'm afraid of the failure. You probably don't want to try until the pain exceeds your fear of change. But you say, God, help me to get to the place where I'm willing to to change. And, and then he'll give you the will and the power to plug into him. So what happens when I open up uh, my life to God's power? The same thing will happen for you that happened for Kelly. When I ask God to, to put the spirit of Jesus Christ in my life, PT, what's going to happen? What does it do? Does it turn me into some kind of religious fanatic? We hope not. Because we got enough of those floating around. The Bible tells us exactly what happens and me and Anthony are not religious fanatics. We're just really excited about Jesus. <laughs> Tell them, Anthony. Amen? I know what y'all were thinking, and we're going to push back on that. There you go. The Bible tells us exactly what happens when we invite God's Spirit into our lives. The Spirit that God gives us fills us with power, love, and self-control. That's a powerful Scripture. Amen? That's what I want in my life. I believe it's what you want in yours, too. I want power in my life. I want power to break habits I can't break on my own. I want power to do the things that I know are right to do, but I can't seem to do them on my own. I want power to break free from the past and let those memories go. I want power to get on with the kind of life that God wants me to live. Obviously, I want that. And I, again, I think you do too. Power, love, and self-control. There's a principle in the universe. This may sound really simple, but this is extremely profound. Are you ready for a profound principle? I have learned, here it is, I have learned that things work best when they are plugged in. <laughs> Toasters, blenders, televisions, fans. Let me tell you a quick fan story. We sleep with two fans in our bedroom. One on my side of the bed and one on her side of the bed. And I have a fan that'll just about blow the paint off the wall. I love my fan. I can't sleep without it. I have a ringing in my ears, and it kind of drowns that out. So Sylvia's usually in the bed before me. I give her a head start because I have a tendency to make a little noise that's irritating to her. I don't know what they call that, but it's a noise that she's not real fond of. And so anyway, uh, I give her a head start usually, and a few, few weeks ago she gets in 
to bed and I'm sitting up and I like to kind of fall asleep in my chair and get real sleepy and then go crawl into bed and, and I get in on my side, you know, and I, I reach over and I turn the fan on and the fan doesn't come on. Now my fan's been sitting there for four or five years and it's always worked. This time it didn't work. And I got irritated. I got up and I kind of in a huff, you know. You finally get sleepy to go to bed and now you got to fix something. So I kind of, you know, that's how the devil does preachers. He just really makes you want to cuss late, late at night. So I throw the covers off and I get up and I look at the fan and I'm playing with the fan and she's hearing me huff and puff. She says, what's wrong with you? I said, my fan's broke. She said, oh, I'm sorry, I unplugged it. <laughs> we have three rules in our house. Three now. It used to be two. The first two were never run out of ketchup, never run out of toilet paper, never unplug my fan. You got to stay connected to the power source, right? You just have to. Because life works best when we're plugged in, and God meant for you and I to be plugged into Him and His power. He's our power source, right? How do I plug into God's power? Let's finish strong. It's real simple believe and receive. First, I believe that God exists, and I believe that He does know and care and have the power to help me. Then I receive Him into my life. Jesus Christ, put your spirit in me. You do that by a four-letter word. The second step of breaking chains and finding recovery involves a four-letter word. And I want to help you to use this four-letter word today. It takes courage to say this word. Everybody say it with me. Help. Say it again. I need help, God. I need help. I need your help in my life. Breaking chains of addiction and hurts and habits and hang-ups is not easy. It, it means facing up to some real problems that you haven't wanted to deal with at this point in your life. It means taking some risk. It means being honest, trusting God. But when you take this second step, all of a sudden your recovery is no longer simply a matter of willpower. God says, I will be with you. When you go through the deep waters and great troubles, I'll be with you. You won't drown. When you walk through the fires of oppression, you won't be burned up. God promises that he'll be with you as you step out to face issues that you've been afraid to face in the past. Where are you hurting today? Think about this. Let's, let's make a personal application first. What hurts in your life? What pain are you denying? What issue are you suppressing and pushing out of your life as though it doesn't exist? And then think outside of your own self and think about some people that you love, that you're passionate about, them experiencing a quality of life that you want something better for them than what they're having right now, but their hurts, habits, and hang-ups, their dysfunction, their addiction is just destroying them. It's eating them up. I want you to think about that person and get an image of them in your mind. And I hope that if you're not a person that's in this place right now that you've taken some good notes over the last couple of weeks because I want to ask you something. You may not be walking through deep waters right now, but I'll guarantee you this, someone you love is. That's just how devastating that this thing is throughout. I was amazed at the feedback that I got after last Sunday's sermon. Some of the texts, some of the conversations, some of the emails that I received. PT, pray for me. You just don't know how bad I've needed this series. This is right where I'm at right now. I need help. I need help. So are you going through some deep waters? Do you feel like you're, you're going under? You're struggling just to keep your head above? Are you, are you going through the fire right now and and the heat's on in your life, and you think, I'm going to get burned, or I'm going to get burned up or burned out? Do you feel like you're stuck in a rut, and you're saying, <clears throat> I, just, I just don't have the power to change this. This addiction has got a hold of me, and I can't break it. I can't, I can't find my way out. It's, it's stifling. It's suffocating. And I can't find my way clear to plug into a power source to get me past this. I want to tell you again, there is a higher power that you can plug into. His name is Jesus Christ. The name above all names. And I invite you to open your heart and your life to him today. Take this second step with me. Now, let me explain something to you. I know that when you hear a sermon like this, if I had not have played Kelly's testimony, you would be inclined to quickly dismiss everything I said if you're struggling with an addiction. You're, you're like, oh, that's preacher talk. Oh, God's power, yada, yada. Yeah, I've heard all that before. I wanted you to see, and I didn't coach her on her testimony. I just asked her to, to edit it down from 45 minutes to three. She almost made it. She almost made it. And she talked about the power of God. And I said, somewhere in this series, this is going to work. 
and it happened to be today. I've got another incredible testimony we're going to share with you next Sunday. But here's what you need to know. Next week, we're going to talk about one of the biggest steps in breaking chains. But here's where we're at today. You can't take the third step if you're not willing to take this one. You've got to plug in to the power source. If you don't take this step, you're going to hear everything we talk about next week, but it's, it's not going to be real and relevant in your life. You're going to want to, but if you skip this one, you can't get to that one. This is the one where life change happens. This is the one. It's faith-driven. But God is not a figment of our imagination. He's not a fairy tale. He's not some far-off fantasy. My God is real. He's not a million miles away, folks. God is real. And the sooner you lean into that, the sooner you embrace that, the sooner you allow Him to come alive in your life, the sooner that your life can change and you can break some chains that are holding you back. So I'm inviting you today. Don't call me a fanatic because I'm passionate about Jesus. You're passionate about a lot of things. All you folks that was on that dance floor Friday night, I saw you. <laughs> I saw you. And I'm wondering why all of you aren't on the front row with me, Anthony, and Heather on Sunday morning. Because you sure did it on Friday night. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. So somebody says to me, well, I'm just not an emotional person. You a lie drunk and a by God. You was, you was an emotional person on Friday night. Amen. I love you in the name of Jesus. I love you all. It's time for you to take a step. It is time for you to take a step. But you got to take this one to get to the next one. And I might would even go as far as to say this is the big one. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And I want everybody in the room to pray this prayer with me. And I want you to pray it for somebody who's broken, burdened, battered, bloodied by the enemy of our soul. Who's holding them in chains. And we're going to pull down some strongholds over their lives today in Jesus' name. Father, in Jesus' name. Everybody pray it with me. In the name of Jesus, I come to you in need of help. Lord, I need help. I can't break this on my own, so I'm plugging in to the power that is granted through God in Christ Jesus. Come into my life. Come into my heart. I want to give my life to you. I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I want to thank you for breaking me free from chains of addiction, hurts, habits, hang-ups, in Jesus' name. I'm going to live free from this day forward. I'm going to take steps and break free in the name of Jesus. Come on, put your hands together. Let's celebrate Jesus in the house today.